Well, this is Cherry, and I just wanted to welcome you to our pediatrics lecture. This is a big enough topic that we're going to divide this up into two parts. Now, you've got a ton of information in your textbook, and this lecture by no means is going to take the place of reading that chapter. Uh, pediatrics are... Um, a special breed. They're not just little people, little adults. They are they are a whole patient all of their own. And so we need to know how to take care of pediatrics because we truly don't take care of them very often. So we don't we're not up on our skills on pediatrics. We don't practice these skills a lot. And we certainly don't see a lot of sick kids. So we oftentimes don't recognize how sick they are. So Pay close attention. I'm going to hit the highlights here, but please go back through your textbook and read through this and make sure you understand this topic very well. So first thing we want to talk about is giving um, patient care, but oftentimes to get to our patient, we have to go through caregivers, and that's usually uh, mom, dad, guardians, uh, foster parents, grandparents, babysitters. Um, and Hands down, I would say the most difficult and stressful calls that EMS providers encounter are calls that deal with children, especially when they don't go well. Um, so we have more than one patient here. We have our pediatric patient, but we also have their family and those that are around them. And those people tend to uh, be very upset, be very stressful and nervous. Sometimes they blame themselves. When things don't go right, they oftentimes are very angry, and that's part of that death and dying process that we've talked about before. It's not just the patients that go through that process of, uh, you know, anger, denial, grieving, bargaining, all of that stuff, uh, but the, the family also goes through that. So if you have a patient that has a poor outcome, you may suffer a lot of... Uh, angry emotions from the family, and please understand that that is just part of their grieving process. Um, other things that we're going to have to deal with, and that's our emotions, is when we deal with a pediatric patient that has been abused. And if we're pretty sure that this child has been abused, um, sometimes it's very difficult to control our emotions and handle that in a logical and sy systematic way and um, not, you know, get angry and punch them in the nose. So our role is to be supportive, to communicate well with them, and uh, let them know what's going on. We want to come across as being competent and confident because they are looking for someone to help. And if you come in there and go, oh, geez, I hate pediatric calls, the parents are not going to be confident, and it's only going to elevate the level of stress. So even if you have to fake it, act like you know what you're doing. Um, and, you know, this is a case we may get that kid on the back of the ambulance as quickly as possible and, and get out of there. Maybe put mom or dad in the front seat of the squad and have our kiddo in the back so that we can kind of think through this and get our head on straight. Um, tell mom and dad or tell the caregivers what you're doing um, as you do it so they feel like they're in the loop. And if there's anything that you can do to have them help you, by all means do it. Oftentimes kids are more comfortable with their caregiver or in the laps of their caregiver. Um, maybe they, they would be better off if they had their favorite blanket or their special toy. Um, you know, those things like that that are going to help out really are a big help for everybody. So the biggest part about pediatrics is that that is such a huge range. It the pediatrics ranges from one minute old to 18 years, and that's a huge range. And there is a ton of changes that happen during those 18 years. And so we, as EMS providers, are kind of stuck with we need to come in and know what is normal for a three-year-old, what is normal for a 10-year-old, what's normal for a two-day-old, and um, there's a lot of tools that can help you with that. Uh, we'll post those on your course page so you've got a little bit of access to them, but you still have to have that fundamental knowledge um, about their normals and what characteristics are normal for them 
and when I'm doing my assessment, what's abnormal? Okay. Pain um, is a little difficult to assess in kids. The younger they are, the more difficult it is to assess. And so we have to use the best tools that we can. Um, I always include pain as like a fifth vital sign because um, we have to treat it at that. It tells us something. It's just with kids, we don't sometimes know what it's telling us. Okay. So um, neonates is our first category that we're going to deal with, and that is birth to one month old. Um, neonates are are uh, the very beginning part of the infant section. So that first month we refer to infants as neonates or newborns, and then infants are from one month to one year. Okay. Um, if we've got infants that are older than six months, sometimes they've kind of got an attachment to mom and dad. They know who mom and dad are. They might not be as crazy about having a stranger hold them. Uh, infants younger than six months generally really don't care who's got them as long as they're um, warm and they're fed and they're dry, they're happy. Uh, toddlers are from one to three years old. Oftentimes we think toddlers go up into kindergarten age and that is not true. Uh, so one to three, they develop their personalities in this time period, um, but they've also uh, develop their, uh, what do I want to say, their limitations and their guidelines. And so part of their guidelines is they generally don't like to be touched by strangers. Um, they definitely do not like to be separated from uh, their, their parents or their caregivers. Um, sometimes they really don't like having their clothes removed. It's okay if they take them off, but they don't want other people taking them off. Uh, these kiddos probably won't tolerate an oxygen mask on their face um, because they don't understand it. it feel, now they'll put a Halloween mask on, but not an oxygen mask. So um, we may have to be a little inventive if we decide that we want to oxygenate them. And they really, really, really don't like needles. So, um, you know, don't, don't talk to them about shots and needles. And they may be afraid of getting a shot because they've had vaccinations when they went to healthcare providers. So they may be very afraid of getting a shot when you arrive. So if you have no intentions of giving them a shot or starting an IV, uh, you might want to assure them that that's not going to happen while you're taking care of them. Okay. So here's a toddler sitting on mom's lap that's very comfortable um, and if, if mom or the caregiver is um, able to be a positive influence on that child, then by all means leave the child with them if you can. Now sometimes you've got parents that are freaking out. And if that's the case, you may want to separate them just a little bit so you can get a little better handle on things. Don't try and take mom away, but maybe give her a job to do. And if you're going to transport and you've got a parent that's really freaking out and not doing well, put them in the front of the ambulance or have them drive their car. You have that right. Okay. Preschoolers are three to six years old. Um, they have a little different thinking. They're able to put things together, make some critical decisions, uh, put two and two together and figure out what's going on. Um, but they have a very literal interpretation of everything you say. Um, so if you say, we're just going to poke this right in here, um, and you're talking about something, um, maybe a seatbelt, uh, poke to them means needle. So you may frighten them by using those terms. They have a very vid vivid imagination. If you've been around kids this age, you certainly know that. Um, sometimes these kiddos think that that's a punishment, especially kids that have been uh, abuse a little bit or maybe you've just watched a movie about that so sometimes you have to kind of get their interpretation and ask a lot of questions and let them explain stuff to you okay uh, they, they're starting to have a little bit of loss of, of their integrity of their body they are aware of uh, pain they're they're aware of blood um, these kids start to start to become aware of death a little bit. They're still pretty immortal, but they understand that death is something that can happen. Okay. Then we move into our school age, and I'm really just hitting the highlights here, but 
um, school age kids you're able to have a conversation with and uh, get their cooperation because you can explain what's going on and why uh, your treatment is going to help um, but these kids are judging you and so be very honest with them be very upfront and as usually as long as you're explaining things as you're doing them let them hold your equipment let them, let them look at that uh, non rebreather and see how it works um, you know and, and explain things and maybe let them help you do things and you're going to get a lot more cooperation out of them these kiddos become very modest though they don't want you to, to see them naked they don't want their clothes off they're very concerned about image and they're starting to become uh, pretty concerned about um, permanent damage that might happen to their body adolescents um, are pretty immortal and invincible okay they're at that especially boys um, once you've got their trust you've got them but you've got to establish trust with them because they're able to think through things and they think they know everything you know there's that old saying that you know I wish I had done all these things when I was 16 and knew all the answers um, so establish some trust with them and for these people specifically you're gonna to have to come in as very confident and very competent to get that trust established um, so talking to them in terms of uh, maybe science if that's if they understand that talk to them about you know uh, some of the little more scientific aspects of what you're doing with them uh, they're going to be afraid a little bit um, so they'll need some reassurance but they're not going to want to ask for it and these guys we really need to respect their privacy so if we're gonna cut their clothes off and look make sure you have a sheet handy if you're gonna cut jeans off cut up the side seam so that you can lay that back over their legs and not if you cut right up the middle and the front of the jeans it's just gonna lay open you can't get them recovered so uh, if you're gonna do that um, if you've got a female on your department that's on this call and you've got a female patient you might think about pairing those two up just for the sake of modesty all right so our our differences between kids and adults are pretty huge okay um, the younger they are the more differences there are obviously so our kids have less blood supply so they can become hypovolemic pretty quickly and they can bleed out pretty quickly uh, they have a lower blood pressure a good way to excuse me my dog's talking to you a good way to kind of estimate blood pressure and I find this very handy is to take um, their age and multiply it times two so if you have a four-year-old multiply that times two gives you eight and add that to 70 so this is the rule of 70 um, add their age doubled plus 70 and that's going to be your lowest systolic blood pressure that you would be acceptable and so for a four-year-old anything lower than 78 is going to be a a hypo um, what I want to say it's gonna be low blood pressure I have my brain fade here um, so a hypotensive child uh, you can do that all the way up uh, until about the age of 12 and then we'll um, use just regular blood pressure so um, they have a faster heart rate and a faster respiratory rate the younger they are the faster those rates are in our young kids um, especially our infants one year and, and younger but sometimes with our, our toddlers as well their extremities may appear mottled so if you give a baby a bath their fingers and toes and everything get blue and kind of splotchy and it's because of the cold it's not because they're hypoxic or lacking oxygen uh, it's simply because they don't regulate their temperatures very well um, we've probably talked about this a lot before but their head is huge compared to their body so if you look at this picture here um, look at you know his body is right here and his head is almost the same size as his whole trunk um, they're huge they're hard for them to hold up so they don't hold their head up well until whoops uh, they're a few months old sorry 
Um, they have, um, like I say, hard, hard for them to control their temperatures, so we have to keep them warm. They're not able to do that as easily themselves. Their airways are smaller, and they don't have the cartilage rings around their trachea like we do as adults. So we can very easily hyperextend that airway if they tip their head too far back, and it will actually collapse that airway because there's no cartilage rings to keep it uh, round and open. Uh, their airway, airway also narrows at the vocal cords. Unlike adults, ours go straight down. Theirs are cone-shaped, and so at the vocal cords, that airway narrows and then goes through the vocal cords and then gets bigger. So it's a perfect place for objects to lodge in there. And if we get a viral infection in that area, it's a very easy for it to occlude that airway completely when it swells. And because kids have um, less body mass and less blood supply, they also dehydrate easily. So a kiddo that has nausea and vomiting for a couple days is probably dehydrated. And so uh, we have to always think about that. Okay. Here's a little chart, and you can find this in your textbook as well, but it estimates the heart rate, respiratory rate, systolic blood pressure of different ages of children. Now I'm going to get out of here quick, and I'm going to, I should have had this pulled up already. Um, there is a thing called a PD wheel, and I, I think you're going to, you may get a lot of good use out of this. I do. They run, um, I don't know, I think they're 15 or $20. Um, but on these PD wheels, you can turn them. So if you know you have a two-year-old, you can slide this around to two years old, and it will tell you the approximate weight of a two-year-old, that what the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure should be, what the pulse rate range would be for that child, respiratory rate, uh, and different things about this child. We can't remember all of that because there's too many variables with our pediatric age ranges. So I would encourage you to get something like this and have it in your jump bag, have it in your squad, keep it on you. And then if you know you're getting paged out to a kid, before you get there, find out what the normals are supposed to be on this kid. So that way you're not walking in blind. You know what to expect, and you'll be able to quickly recognize the abnormals. And that'll be huge. So you can look at uh, for that PD wheel online. Um, you know, I can, we can just see really quick how much they are. Ten seventy five for that one. So they are cheap. And... Um, I, I think they're worth their weight in gold to have something like that. Okay, so this kind of gives you that. Um, you can look at this in your book and kind of see how those pressures range um, and, the, and the different rates change. So we talked a little bit about the airway, but in infants, uh, there's a few other considerations. So um, they have a ginormous tongue. So if you go to do anything with the airway, um, or if you get any swelling or anything, that tongue is in the way all the time, which means they can, the tongue can occlude the airway much easier than it can on an adult. Um, there's not much room in their mouth for other things once they get their tongue in there. So their trachea is about four to five millimeters in diameter, which is not much. It's very tiny. Um, it's much more pliable, like we talked about. And because it doesn't have the cartilage rings, just a pressure on that soft tissue under the chin can completely obstruct the airway. Um, I have actually seen babies with their chin on top of the crib rail, and they're pushing on it, kind of hanging there, and they've actually occluded their airway and passed out because they um, block their airway completely just by the rail of their bed. Um, our newborns are obligate nose breathers, so which means they don't know how to breathe through their mouth. If their nose gets clogged with boogers, they can't breathe. And so sometimes our, you know, my baby can't breathe, my baby can't breathe, is simply you need to grab a booger sucker and, and clean out their nostrils, and voila, it's fixed. Um, 
So we need to remember that with our infants and our newborns, uh, that we have to keep their nose clear and we have to keep it unobstructed for them to breathe. Um, the epiglottis on our kids is higher in the airway than it is with adults. So it makes it um, a little easier for them to choke and it makes it a little harder for paramedics, should you guys decide to go on to paramedics, uh, to intubate these kids. They're a little harder to uh, intubate. Their head, we talked about, is larger. Their um, head and neck are more prone to injury simply because when they fall, they their head is heaviest. So these kids are going to fall head first because of the weight of their head, which makes them more prone to injury. And um, their bones are more pliable and soft. So, again, um, that makes them a little more prone to injury as well. So when we... Um, position a child, we want to put some padding under their shoulders. My theory is if you have a baby, you probably have diapers. So stick a diaper or two under their shoulders. That's going to elevate their trunk just enough to put that head in a sniffing position. Um, and so here we've got this little guy laying on a blanket. Same thing. Can you see how he's just laying here? His chin is down. When you put a towel under him, his airway is up in that neutral inline position, which is exactly how we need it when we're working with our kiddos. Okay. Infants um, have a different little thing uh, called their fontanelles, or sometimes it's called the soft spots. And you can see these are little indentations right here on the top of their head where the um, plates in their scalp have not yet grown together. And so really right underneath there is their brain. And you have to be very careful with those. Uh, the other thing you can look at is if they're sunken in like they are in this little picture, um, this baby is probably dehydrated. And if they're bulging, then they've got increased pressure in their head more than they really should have because the brain and the tissues inside that skull are trying to bulge out. So it's a great way to evaluate babies is to be able to look at that, but we do have to handle them carefully. Okay. Um, in their chest and lungs, ribs are more pliable. Um, when, they're, when they're newborn, everything is actually just cartilage still. It isn't even truly bone. Um, but as they age, it gets a little harder, but their ribs stay pliable for a long time. Uh, they're more horizontal. Uh, and not quite so rounded like ours are. Um, their lung tissues are more fragile. So if we ventilate a baby or a child too much, we can literally blow their lungs out. So we've got to be very gentle with our, our ventilations. We want to absolutely do ventilations if they're required, but slow and easy. Okay. Um, you're not going to see a ton of chest rise with normal breathing on kids. In fact, our babies are more belly breathers. Um, and so they're actually going to be normal for them to have that seesaw belly breathing um, because their belly muscles are a little more formed than their chest muscles are. So they don't really have the ability to use those intercostal muscles like we adults do. Um, anytime you have a respiratory rate of greater than 60, they're breathing way too fast, regardless of their age. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Greater than 60 is bad. Okay. Um, children younger than 5 generally have a breathing rate twice that of adults. So that gives you another kind of a good rule of thumb to go by. Okay. Um, with our heart, when kids are scared or hypoxic or working hard, running hard, playing hard, or they become hypovolemic, they get low on volume, whether that's from dehydration or bleeding, um, their heart rate goes up. And that's really no different than adults. Okay. Um, however, bradycardia is a late response to hypoxia. So if you've got a kiddo that is unable to breathe for whatever reason, uh, whether it's asthma, anaphylaxis, uh, they have boogers in their nose and can't breathe, um, they're going to first get tachycardic and then their heart rate is going to start to drop and they're going to get bradycardic. Okay. Um, newborns will go bradycardic almost right away. They don't really have that compensatory 
mechanism in place. Um, and they don't have as much blood to move around, so every red blood cell counts with them. In our kids, hypotension or low blood pressure is not going to develop until they have lost more than 30% of their blood volume. So one third of their blood volume will be gone before you're going to see a change in blood pressure. Um, that's pretty huge because if you're waiting to see that low blood pressure to see how sick they are, you're going to be really behind the eight ball trying to get them uh, back up and running. So they don't really have the ability to increase their strength of their contractions yet because those muscles haven't developed quite that fully. So that limits their ability to compensate. So they can raise the rate, but their body really can't change the strength of those uh, contractions. Okay. Um, again, muscles are less developed in the abdomen. Um, because of where the liver and spleen are and the size of them in our kiddos, they, in adults, our liver and spleen sit up under our rib cage. On kids, they're big enough that they don't. So when kids fall off of monkey bars or um, their hoverboard or whatever they happen to be doing, they're much more at risk for lacerating that liver and spleen, which could cause uh, a ton of internal bleeding and maybe death. Extremities, um, our kids get a lot more of what we call green stick fractures. So a green stick fracture is more of a twisting. It's not a complete fracture. The bone doesn't break, but it more splinters. So if you can think of trying to break a dry stick that you find and you, you bend it and break it, that's like breaking an adult bone. But if you take that same size stick and it's green, you just got it off the tree or the bush and you try and break it, uh, you have to like twist it and it splinters and cracks, but it doesn't really come apart. That's a green stick fracture. Um, now, for us in the field, do we care? I mean, a fracture is a fracture. We're not going to know what it is really until we x-ray it anyway. But just so you kind of understand, they don't have the same process. They can fracture, but you probably won't see that huge deformity that you might see in an adult because that bone's going to stay together more even though it is fractured. Okay. And our motor development in our kids, I find this interesting, occurs from our head to our toe. So they're going to learn to do things with their face before they learn to do it with their hands. Um, so they'll learn how to stick their tongue out and do sucking motions and smile. Um, and then down the road, they'll learn how to reach out and grab things with their hands. Um, and then they'll learn to sit up. And then they'll learn uh, to crawl because they're using the large part of their legs. And then uh, when it... Uh, they're, I don't know, a year or so old usually before they've got the balance and the coordination in their feet to actually walk. So head, head to toe, they learn to develop. Okay. Their metabolic rate is much faster, so they're going to use a lot more oxygen and a lot more glucose, and they're dependent on these. So when they don't have them, they will crump faster than, they, than an adult will, uh, and they'll deteriorate very quickly. So they... Uh, um, always are running the risk of becoming hypoglycemic. Newborns, they actually check newborns' blood sugar levels. If they're a little bit lethargic, they check their blood sugar because they'll burn a lot of that up just in the delivery process. We have kids that have a large skin surface, um, and they don't have a very good temperature regulator, so they're at risk for hypothermia. Their skin is thinner and more delicate, very similar to how our geriatrics will be. Um, so they don't have that layer of fat in there generally to help uh, insulate their body. Okay, So let's talk a little bit about um, our assessment. When we arrive on scene, there's some things we want to look for. Okay, We want to look for clues about the nature of the problem. Um, and this is going to be living conditions, um, we want to make sure that the story we're getting matches the injuries and matches the surroundings because, unfortunately, some of these kids are abused. And you may be the only person that is allowed into that situation to recognize what's going on with this kid and intervene. 
Uh, we are mandatory reporters. You are required to report abuse. And if you don't, you can lose your EMT license. So, but more importantly, we got to protect these kiddos if they're being abused. They cannot protect themselves. So we're looking for those signs. We're also looking to see if we need additional resources and make sure the scene is safe for us and our patients. Okay, so we're going to use the pediatric assessment triangle. Um, and I'm going to skip right to that quick because we're going to talk about this. This happens from the doorway. So before you ever approach your child, once you know the scene is safe and you walk up to where you can see them, pause for just a couple seconds and we're going to look at these things. So the first thing we're going to look at is up here at the top of the triangle is appearance. And we're going to look at them where they are. So we're looking, how are they interacting with their caregivers? How are they interacting with their um, with their surroundings and the environment? Um, how are they positioned? You know, if you've got a kiddo that's sitting on mom's lap and babbling and talking, that's way different than walking in and seeing that same child sitting in mom's lap just floppy, just there, lethargic. Um, that's two different two different cases entirely. Um, so we want to see how are they positioned? Are they in the tripod position? Are they curled up in the fetal position? Uh, are they floppy and limp? Uh, so all those things are going to play into the appearance. The next thing we're going to look at is over here um, on the, I think it's, it's my left-hand side. I think it's yours too. And we're going to look at work of breathing. Okay, now understand nobody should have to work to breathe. You don't get up and say, oh, yeah, I, th I think I'll take a deep breath now. It, it just happens. So if you've got a kid that's working to breathe, that is not, that's going to be a red flag. So we're looking for abnormal sounds, abnormal posture and positioning. We're looking for nasal flaring. We're looking for head bobbing um, yeah, and retraction. So you can see those things and hear them from from the distance, um, if you can recognize any of that from a distance, this kid is sick. Okay. Um, same thing with the parents. You know, if they're not interacting normally, that's a red flag. Those are sick kids. And the last thing we're going to look at from the doorway is the circulation to the skin. So what we want to see is uh, from a distance, can you see, or as you're walking up to this kiddo, uh, what's his skin color? And we may have to look at mu mucous membranes because sometimes kids all look pale. So look at those mucous membranes in their eyes um, or in their mouth inside their lip. We're looking for modeling. We're looking for cyanosis. And petechiae are those tiny, tiny little red specks on the skin that happen when capillaries burst. And oftentimes that happens when you get a kid that... Um, is not getting adequate blood flow. We see it a lot in adults and people that are strangled um, because that, that strangulation and not getting the oxygen will break blood vessels in the face and in the eyes. So look there because that's going to give you an idea of uh, if there's a problem with their breathing. And based on this, this is called the pediatric assessment triangle, and it's a really quick pediatric assessment as you're approaching this patient. And based on what you find here, you're going to make that decision, is this kid sick or not sick? If you've got a red flag in any one of those areas, this kid is sick. Okay? It's really simple, and it's really, really effective. Now, you want to do it from the door because as you approach, this kid is going to change the way he's interacting. Okay, so as you approach, especially depending on their age, you're now a stranger coming in, and they've been told that strangers are dangerous. And all of a sudden, you're not just a stranger, but you're coming up, you're dressed funny, um, you drove up in a really loud, noisy vehicle, and you've got, there's more than one of you, and you're carrying a bag of something, and you've got a stethoscope around your neck, and you are just kind of scary. So they're going to change their interactions. So we want to get that picture when they're in their normal situation. Okay, so things that we're going to find when we have an abnormal pediatric assessment triangle. Uh, we're going to recognize pediatric distress. Uh, we should be able to recognize, not pediatric distress, respiratory distress, respiratory failure. 
Uh, you'll be able to recognize compensated and decompensated shock. If our brain is not being perfused, we're going to see that in an altered mental status. And if we've got cardio or pulmonary failure, all of those things, which are all extremely life-threatening, we will be able to recognize simply from that assessment. So practice that. And, and just it's three simple things to remember, and it uh, works really well. So when we approach with our kids, these are a little different than our adults. Okay, If there's no pulse, we begin chest, chest compressions. No change there. But if we have a pulse that's less than 60 and signs of poor perfusion, um, and poor perfusion being altered mental status, skin color, respiratory distress, respiratory arrest, respiratory failure, um, working to breathe, uh, any of those things. Um, and quite honestly, in our younger kids, if they have a heart rate less than 60, you're going to see signs of poor perfusion. Um, if we have that happen, we're going to start chest compressions. Because remember, we talked about bradycardia being a late sign of decompensated shock. So if they're already in decompensated shock, they literally are circling the drain. And if we don't do something and be very aggressive with our treatments, we're going to lose them. So we're starting chest compressions at a rate of 60 if, they're, if they have any, any signs of olive pore perfusion. Okay. If we got a heart rate of greater than 60, then we're going to move on and we're going to do our, our uh, primary and secondary assessment on our kids. Okay. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. It's in your book. You can find it. Um, but there is a Glasgow Coma Scale for pediatrics, okay? And it is different than our adult because a lot of our pediatrics, part of our adult scale is a verbal response. Well, some of our kids can't talk on a good day, so that's not a good way to measure them. So this measures on eye-opening, uh, motor response, and the best verbal response, but it's geared towards kids. So it talks about grunting and crying, um, rather than how they're forming their words. So um, kind of take a quick look at that and know where you can get to it if you're going to have a pediatric patient. Okay. Airway is a huge, huge concern with our kids. Um, if our kids have an obstructed airway from whatever cause, whether it's a foreign body obstruction or whether it's swelling, um, they can become hypoxic, and they can and will die if we don't fix it. So we talked about those differences, but what we want to do is we want to look at the breathing. So look at the airway and listen with your ears because the sounds that that airway makes will tell the story that you need to know. Um, we'll talk about our breath sounds in just a minute here, but um, listen and pay attention to what you're hearing. Then we're going to look at the tidal volume, look at how much air and how quickly or not quickly, our patient is breathing. If they look like they are breathing inadequately, then we are going to jump on positive pressure ventilations with supplemental oxygen. Okay. With our adults, we may let them work through that just a little bit and see how they're doing. But if you've got a kid that is not moving air, you better be on the bag valve mask because they're tired and they will quit breathing. And they probably have been breathing inadequately for a period of time to get that, to get tired. So um, I have told all of my students, and I'm going to tell you guys, be really, really aggressive with your airway management on kids. And um, because it's what kills them. So... Let's take a look at what we're looking at. Normal breathing rates are 25 to 30 in an infant, 15 to 30 in a child. Okay, We're going to listen for noises like we talked about. We'll talk about those noises in one second. And then we're looking for signs of hypoxia and respiratory distress. Uh, cap capillary refill is an excellent tool in our kids. So respiratory distress, um, we're looking for that head bobbing, accessory muscle use, nasal flaring, tripod positioning, grunting. They have that little uh, uh, as they're breathing. Um, and head, head bobbing. If you don't know what those are, um, get on YouTube and Google those things. There are some great videos of kids in respiratory distress. Um, 
so possible causes would be obviously hypoxia, um, but rapid breathing could be caused from a head injury, uh, a lung infection, a fever, diabetes uh, with high blood sugar. They're trying to breathe all that sugar off and they'll breathe fast. <coughs> Some poisonings, particularly aspirin, will cause them to breathe very rapidly. Uh, shock because that um, sympathetic nervous system will be stimulated when they're in shock. That's going to increase the respiratory rate. Uh, stress, fear, and pain like it does with all of us. Okay. So sounds that we're going to be listening for. Okay, Coughing, gagging, gasping is probably going to tell you that they have secretions in their airway or they have a partial blocked airway. Okay, There's something in there that's causing them to cough and gag. So... Um, we want to make sure that we take care of that. Uh, crackles, you're going to hear with your stethoscope only. Okay? And you're going to have to listen carefully. Um, if the kiddo is crying, that makes that difficult. But crackles, just like our adults, says that there's fluid in the, in the alveoli. Eye, okay? Wheezing tells us that we have narrowing bronchioles. And wheezing a lot of times indicates asthma, almost always. But it's in the lower airway. The way I can remember it, it has a Z in it, and Z is at the bottom of the alphabet, so that sound comes from the bottom part of the airway. Okay? Strider is that high-pitched crowing sound, and if you've ever heard a child with croup, um, you'll, you'll know what strider is. It's that ah, 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 kind of sound, um, and that's an upper airway obstruction. So strider is a high-pitched sound, it comes from obstruction high in the airway. Okay? And then diminished breathing is uh, we're just not moving, we're not moving air in part of the lung or part of both lungs. And that's usually caused from an obstruction. Uh, it could be because the bronchioles are completely closed or narrowed shut, or it may be a pneumonia where we've got mucus in there and it's not allowing um, the air to move. So with our kids, we want to check the circulation. So we've checked the airway, the breathing. We're going to check circulation, and we're going to do that by checking a pulse. So with our older kids, we can check a radial or carotid pulse. But with our babies, we're going to go brachial because they don't have a neck to check the carotid, and it's really hard to find in their, in their radial, uh, in their wrist. So we're going to check in the brachial. It's really easy to find. I encourage you, if you're around a baby, to just... Try it and see how easy it is to, to find. Okay, um, So it's in their upper arm. You just press down a little bit. You don't want to press so hard that you collapse that artery, um, but press and you can feel the pulse. Other things that uh, we can check in our kids is capillary refill. Pulse oximetry is extremely hard to get in our younger kids, and it's almost um, a not good use of our time to try. And you have to have special equipment to do that. So capillary refill is a very valuable and viable assessment in our kids. Um, we also want to check a blood pressure if we've got a kiddo older than three. Less than three, we're not going to do a blood pressure. Okay? We want to check urine output. If they're in diapers, that is really easy. Just ask mom if they have a normal, she's been changing diapers at the normal rate or more or less. If you've got a kid that's got a lot of sugar in their system, they're going to be peeing a lot. So we may have a ton of wet diapers. Uh, if you've got a kid that's dehydrated, you may not be having wet diapers. So um, that's a good way to check. And then we're going to check that mental status. Again, a good place to ask is ask the caregiver. It, are they acting normal to you? So with our infants, it may be hard for us to recognize what's normal and what's not, but the caregivers will definitely know. Okay. Here's checking uh, capillary refill on our kiddos. Uh, we can just take their little hand on those infants and squeeze the back of their hand, then pull your thumb up and see how quickly that skin returns to the pink color, to a normal color. Uh, we don't necessarily have to do it on their fingernails. Okay, And then we'll see how long that takes to return. Okay. So we're going to consider um, our Pediatric assessment triangle, we're going to look at our primary assessment findings, um, and we're going to prioritize this patient. So patients that absolutely will be priority patients, if they're in respiratory distress, 
Um, so listen to listen to the difference here. Respiratory distress, they are working to breathe. Okay, but they are breathing. Uh, they're they're perfusing adequately. So they've got enough compensatory stuff there, and they've got enough muscle strength to go ahead and work hard enough to get oxygen to their cells and their brain. Okay, respiratory failure is they are still breathing, but they're not getting enough oxygen. Okay, so they're breathing but not ventilating. And respiratory arrest, they quit breathing altogether. So it's very, very easy to get arrest and failure mixed up. Okay, respiratory failure is still breathing, but not moving enough oxygen. So it could be because they're tired, it could be because there's a blockage, um, but they're breathing. Respiratory arrest is when they give up. So respiratory arrest is no breathing at all. And then, so any of those, because respiratory distress will quickly move to failure and arrest if we don't fix it. Um, and so any signs of poor perfusion. So any of those four things will make these kiddos an absolute priority patient. So in our secondary assessment, after our trauma patients, we're going to perform our assessment and then our history and then get some vital signs. Okay. For our responsive patient with a medical problem, we're going to um, maybe do a focused assessment after we get done with our secondary. So we're going to look at maybe just those things that are wrong and not concentrate so much on that head to toe like we would in a trauma. Okay. Now for our younger patients, as we approach, we're always going to try and work with them from the toe up to the head. Okay, because it's not as threatening if you reach out and touch their little toe or tickle the bottom of their foot. That's not as threatening as you reaching towards their face or reaching up to listen to their lung sounds. That scares them. So if we can start at the toe and come up, we build a little bit of trust with them. Um, so on your responsive patients, that's a good approach. Another good approach is to get down at their level. Um, squat down, kneel down, so you're at eye level with them. If you're hovering over them, you're intimidating and you're scary. And we want to um, let them know that we're there to help, not to scare them or hurt them. Um, pulse oximetry is, like we talked about, difficult to use. Um, you have to have special equipment on our little, little kids. So uh, cap refill works good. Your cap refill should be less than two seconds for that skin or that nail bed to return to the normal color. So if you've got that returning back in less than two seconds, they're probably perfusing very well. If it takes longer than two seconds, then you probably have a little bit of poor perfusion going on. And in that case, we may think about adding some additional oxygen. So what I like to do is keep their SATs between 94 and 99. Now, if, on room air, if they're 100 percent, then Yay, that's a good thing. Um, but if I'm giving them oxygen and I'm at 100%, I don't know if I'm giving them too much oxygen. So if I can back that off to about 99, I know they're getting plenty, but not too much. I'm not causing harm uh, and, and causing what we call oxygen toxicity uh, and creating um, brain damage by doing that. So also know that in shock and hypothermia, when you're not perfusing well and you're cold, your pulse oximetry um, is not going to be adequate at all. So I, you got to know that and understand. Okay. Um, another way we can do heart rate, because sometimes pulses are kind of hard to find, is listen with our stethoscope. And that's called uh, an ap epical uh, listening to a... Uh, listening to their heart tones. So we're listening with our stethoscope and counting, and that's certainly something that you can consider doing with kids. It, it works very well. Okay, uh, We can compare our peripheral and our central pulses if you can find them. Uh, it helps you to know how well they're perfusing or not. And like we said, take a blood pressure in patients older than three, but we have to use appropriate size cuffs. 
Your blood pressure cuff should cover two thirds of the upper arm. If you're using one that's bigger than that, you're going to get a, a an incorrect reading. Okay. So things that we can do is look at our kiddo. Uh, I think we've talked about it, a lot of those. Use a calm voice. Talk to your kiddo. Use him. Uh, include him in the conversation. Um, don't ask a boatload of yes and no questions. Give him time to talk to you uh, or explain things. Um, be careful the words that you choose. Okay. Keeping kiddo with parent almost almost always is a good thing. Now, like I say, you're going to have those times when it isn't, but um, generally it's a good thing. Um, don't explain things too far in advance because they live in the moment. So talk about what you're going to do right now and how they can help you and how this is going to be a good thing for them. Let them handle your equipment. Kids love pulse oximetries. So if you can put it, have them put it on you and then have them put it on themselves, that works great. Even if it's not actually working, they still think it's cool. Um, so, you know, if you're not using to actually check their pulse ox, um, it gives them something they think that they're doing and it doesn't hurt and it's not scary and dangerous if you let them touch it. Um, I usually let the kids um, use my stethoscope a little bit and hear their own heart rates or hear my heart rate and then uh, let them do theirs. And sometimes I let them play with the pen lights. They, you're building that relationship. Okay. So on our reassessment, we're going to monitor our mental status, uh, airway, breathing, and circulation, just like we do our adults. Um, but remember in our kids, our kids are strong and healthy and they have good, strong hearts. They are going to compensate and compensate and compensate. But when they quit compensating, it's just like they step off a cliff. So they don't look sick. They don't look sick. They don't look sick. And the next thing you know, they aren't even breathing. So I have been told this, I can't tell you how many times in my EMT class, my intermediate EMT class, my paramedic class, I did not recognize it until it happened to my own son. And um, by the time I realized he was sick and got him to the hospital, uh, two days later he was on a ventilator and headed to, the, to a um, helicopter ride to Omaha. And we almost lost him, and I honestly did not realize how sick he was, even being a paramedic, until it got so bad that it was like, oh, yeah, he's really sick. Um, I missed those signs. So uh, it's important that we always remember that. Okay, this is the thing I want you to take away from this. The leading cause of cardiac arrest in pediatric patients is respiratory failure. But before they get to respiratory failure, they're going to be in respiratory distress. That's the point when we can fix this. So when they're in respiratory distress, you know that they're headed to respiratory failure and cardiac arrest if we don't turn this around. And get aggressive. If you have a patient that will let you put a nasal cannula on, then you, by gosh, better be doing it. If they'll let you put a non-rebreather on and they're not going to be pulling it off, then put it on, okay? And if they're going to let you assist their ventilations with a bag valve mask, then you do it. Um, because if we don't help these kiddos when they get too tired to breathe on their own or help them to oxygenate themselves by pushing more air into their lungs, they're only going to deteriorate. So airway, 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 and be aggressive. Okay? Um, I think we've talked about all those, okay? Uh, early respiratory distress we talk about is uh, adequate depth and rate, but their work of breathing, they're working harder. So their breathing is okay, but they're having to work harder to do it, okay? We're gonna provide oxygen to those guys and transport immediately. This is a priority patient. Uh, respiratory distress, we're gonna see flared nostrils. We're gonna see retractions in their neck and um, in that middle part of their throat right there. Um, we're going to see retractions in their rib cage uh, and maybe where they're sucking in between their belly, using their belly to breathe just a little bit. We're going to hear strider, grunting, wheezing maybe. Um, they'll be sitting in a tripod position. They will not want to lie down no matter what. 
Um, and maybe in that sniffing position where they've just got their head up just a little bit, or maybe their jaw jutted out a little bit in the case of epiglottitis. Okay. Um, like we've talked about sometimes audible wheezing, seesaw respirations where they're using their belly. Um, okay. So decompensated or respiratory failure. Now this, they're still breathing, but they're not able to oxygenate themselves. Um, so their tidal volume could be inadequate or their respiratory rate is inadequate. Okay. These people you have got to ventilate. You've got to put some positive pressure ventilation and help them ventilate because they're not doing it on their own. So what we're going to see with them, they're going to be irritable, maybe unconscious, maybe lethargic. Um, depending on how much effort they can still put into this, you might see nasal flaring. You might see retractions. Uh, you might see all those things. Head bobbing, if you've got head bobbing, you have a really sick kid. Okay. Um, other things that we might see are cyanosis, pale skin, or maybe mottled hands and feet. Okay. And those are all going to tell us that they're not perfusing well. Altered mental status is going to tell us that they're not perfusing well. But we're going to see some of that work of breathing go away because they're getting too tired. But what we're going to see is the tidal volume goes down and the respiratory rate um, will eventually go down. And we're eventually going to see this kid will become bradycardic. Okay. So respiratory rate of greater than 60. Um, cyanosis, decreased muscle tone. Uh, maybe using a lot of accessory muscles, and maybe as they start to tire out, maybe not so much. But they're going to have um, all those signs of poor perfusion. Okay, So patients in respiratory failure, that's decompensated respiratory failure, we're going to get positive pressure ventilation. Okay, Don't be afraid to do it. Okay, If they've got enough strength to fight off that bag valve mask, then they probably don't need it. But... Let them prove to you that they don't need it. Okay. Uh, respiratory rest. Respiratory rate of less than 10. Okay, so they are working on not breathing at all, or maybe they are not breathing at all. Maybe they have irregular or just gasping respirations. In your CPR class, they talked about agonal respirations. That's what we're talking about here. They have very limp muscle tone, so they're just floppy and flaccid. Uh, most of the time, these patients are unresponsive. Um, they have a slower than normal or an absent heart rate. If it's an absent heart rate, they're not only in respiratory arrest, but they're in cardiac arrest. Okay? Uh, they're probably going to be very hypotensive, and we're probably not even going to check a blood pressure because we're going to be really worried about making sure we're breathing for them. Okay? So we're going to see those things happen in our kid that we just talked about here. Okay? So those guys are getting positive pressure ventilation, supplemental oxygen, and CPR if needed. Okay. So let's talk about it real quick. I know we've been doing this for a while. Partial airway obstruction. The airflow is inadequate, but they're moving air past the obstruction. So we're going to hear strider with these patients because it's an upper airway obstruction. Um, so we're going to encourage them to cough and... Um, Try and get that out. So if they're moving airflow through there and you're hearing that strider and they've got the ability to cough, they're probably okay. Um, but strider is going to be a big symptom there. Um, partial airway obstruction, they're going to probably using intercostal, intercla or sub, uh, supraclavicle retractions. You may hear crowing or other noisy respirations. They might be crying. Uh, they might be trying to cough and get it out, which is good. We'll just let them do that. If it is a complete airway obstruction or if it's a partial airway obstruction that becomes complete, then they're not going to be able to breathe at all. And they won't be talking. They won't be crying. Um, eventually, they're going to get an altered mental status. They may become unresponsive and probably become cyanotic. So we need to... Uh, fix this airway if this is what's going to happen. If they've got secretions or vomitus or blood in their mouth, we need to suction that out. 
But with our kids, we're going to suction for three to five seconds, not the 15 for an adult. Okay. Make sure you use a smaller tube for smaller airways. That yang power on a kiddo is going to be too much. And only go as far as you can see. You go too much, there's a nerve back there called the vagus nerve. If you stimulate that by suctioning back there, it will drop their heart rate right now. And now you have a bradycardic, not breathing kid. Um, so only suction as far as you can see. Okay. Um, if they don't have a gag reflex, we can put an OPA or a pharyngeal in there. Uh, we don't use NPAs in our pediatric patients in general. So with our kiddos, we're going to put an OPA in. You can see right here they've got a tongue depressor, so they've measured it. They have the right length. Um, they're going to put a tongue depressor in to hold this tongue down, and they're going to slide the OPA, OPA in, um, not upside down like we put them in with an adult. They're going to slide it in over the tongue depressor and behind the tongue. So there isn't room to turn that around with their big tongues. So we use a tongue depressor to kind of push the tongue down and use it as kind of a runway for our OPA. Um, if we're using positive pressure ventilation, then we need to supply uh, oxygen with that. We want to make sure we use the correct size of bag valve mask. There's generally three or four sizes, um, newborns, the, the infant, uh, and then pediatric, and then adult. So, um, Make sure you've got the, the right size bag valve mask. In your textbook, it may give you a rate at which to ventilate this. Um, however, American Heart Association has just come out with new guidelines, and their guidelines kind of trump everything. So um, we are going to go by these new guidelines, and that's one breath every six seconds that we're um, for a patient. And that is. Um, for every age of child. So a breath every six seconds, regardless of how old our child or our adult is. So we want to do nice, slow, even breaths and make sure that um, we're not ventilating too quickly or too forcefully. Okay. Uh, if the patient's breathing adequately, then we're going to go ahead and make sure that we keep their SpO2 up like we should. Um, if our kiddo is not going to tolerate a cannula or a mask, then we can try this blow-by method. And um, so for a little kid, you can just hold a mask down there. But if you've got a kiddo that's a little older, um, you can put it in a paper cup. I usually take a marker and draw a little happy face inside on the bottom of the cup. And then I poke the hose through where the nose should be on that face. And... Then I'm, I tell them, you know, look at that little face in there. Look at that little face and hold it up and have them look down in the cup looking at that face. Now, I'm a long ways from being an artist, but um, they don't seem to care. So that's a nice way because sometimes they just don't let you put a mask on. If mom can hold that close to their face, that works excellent too. Okay. So positioning our patient is kind of important. We want to position them in the com position of comfort. If they can't breathe, that's probably going to be sitting up. So put them on uh, mom's lap. Uh, you know, when we're taking them down the road, they should be in a car seat. So, you know, maybe put them in a car seat and strap that to your cot and have mom sit next to them um, in the airway seat. Um, but while you're on location, they can sit and sit in the caregiver's lap. Okay. If we have an unresponsive patient, we're going to put them in the lateral recumbent. So on their left side, in case they vomit, they're not going to aspirate that. Uh, if we're ventilating this patient, then they need to be in the supine position so we can do that. Okay. Um, if we can't get our ventilations to go in when, with a, a child that has an airway obstruction, first thing we want to do is reposition the airway. Okay. Um, if we can't reposition that airway, then we want to do what we can do to get it fixed or get, um, get it cleared. So um, like we talked about, if they're choking and have a mild foreign body airway obstruction, uh, we can let them cough, try and get it out, maybe give them some supplemental oxygen and watch them very closely. 
if it's severe, then we need to take action to get that loose. So for a, an infant, and you know what, kids choke on stuff all the time. So for an infant, we're going to put them prone. So we're going to put them face down on our arm and use our hands. You can see here he's, he's using his fingers. Um, I typically um, separate my fingers. I don't know if you all know, remember Mork from Orc or not, but um, separate my fingers to form a V, and I put the V on either side of their nose. So I'm supporting their head. Tip their Tip their head down. You want their head lower than their feet because when you get this out, first thing they're going to do is take a big old breath of air. <gasps> and if you don't have a gravity working for you, that object is just sitting right there at the top of the airway. And when they take a breath, they're going to suck it right back in. So put their head down so when that object comes out, it comes out of their mouth or at least falls forward enough they're not going to suck it back in. So put them on your forearm support their head, put one foot on either side of the arm, lower their head, and you're going to hit them. And I think it's called back slaps, I think is what the term is that we're supposed to use. But you're literally going to take the heel of your hand and you're going to hit them right between the shoulder blades. We're going to do five back blows. Okay. Then we're going to kind of sandwich them, flip them over so they're face up, and do five chest thrusts, just like we were doing CPR, with two fingers right in the middle of their chest between the nipple line. Um, so it's five chest thrusts, back over, five back blows, back over, five chest thrusts, uh, and keep doing that until you either get the object out or they become unresponsive. Okay, No finger sweeps unless we can see that object and we know we can get them out because you're probably going to just push it down deeper. Okay, so when our infant goes unresponsive, we're going to start CPR. So lay them on a hard surface and look in their mouth to see if you have anything in there. If you can see it and get it out, do so. If not, we're going to go straight to um, chest compressions and two ventilations. So 30 chest compressions, two ventilations, but look in their mouth before you give them a ventilation because those chest compressions may very easily have popped that out. Um, and we're going to continue that. For our older kids, same thing, um, If but instead of doing the back blows and chest thrusts, we're going to do the Heimlich maneuver, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. With our kids, you put your hand uh, between their... Uh, midway between their belly button and their xiphoid process, wrap the other hand over it. We're going to get behind them, probably on our knees, and come in and up really quickly and try and dislodge that. Okay. If they go unresponsive, then we start CPR. So same thing, look in their mouth before you give a ventilation. Otherwise, we're doing a CPR with two breasts and 30 compressions. Okay, and there we are doing that. So look in the mouth before you give a ventilation, and if you can get the object out, then do. And that is all I have for you guys. Aren't you delighted? <laughs> okay. So any questions, give me a holler. But otherwise, we'll continue on with uh, the second part of this very soon. Have a great night.